Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, weekly town hall meeting. Uh, this uh, uh, town hall meeting uh, um, uh, comes to you uh, from uh, uh, Costas Rizopoulos and myself. Uh, we're business partners, uh, and um, uh, we um, are co-founders of the Hands-On Organization, um, uh, hands-on diagnostics, hands-on seminars, and um, hands-on uh, physical therapy. Um, and um, uh, I would like us to start today with um, uh, a couple of uh, quick updates um, and answer some of your questions. Um, and then um, we would like to share with you uh, a few things and, and, and open really um, the microphones to everyone who would like to share. And uh, my personal preference is that if instead of just looking at your names up there, that you guys activate your cameras also, those of you who have a camera or who would like to share a camera, so uh, we can be able to just uh, see your faces too, instead of uh, just a name. Um, it was very interesting um, uh, because uh, right after we finished um, uh, last week's town hall meeting, uh, literally 15 minutes uh, after the ending of the meeting, the big announcement came on uh, uh, Medicare, uh, where uh, Medicare uh, announced paying uh, full um, uh, full amount for uh, physical therapy services. Um, so um, at this point, uh, you are able for both new patients as well as existing patients to bill initial evaluation codes as well as treatment codes, those treatment codes that are approved uh, for patients who um, are uh, Medicare. Um, now, um, somebody um, had asked me uh, the question, um, can a physical therapy assistant uh, who in your office is able to treat a patient, can that physical therapy assistant uh, treat a Medicare patient via telehealth? Um, a, some of you may already have received uh, the announcement earlier today from APTA that physical therapy assistants can treat um, uh, a uh, Medicare patient via telehealth under the supervision of a physical therapist. Um, now, the supervision of a physical therapist at this point um, has not been clarified yet if it can be a virtual supervision or it has to be on-site supervision. But for example, if you are, um, let's say, if you are an essential service in your state and you, you have an open location, your office is open, and let's say in the practice you have a physical therapy assistant and yourself, you are a licensed physical therapist. So you can, uh, the, your physical therapy assistant can deliver um, uh, those um, telehealth services since you are in the vicinity, in the same physical location with that physical therapy assistant. Eventually, what, what uh, the APTA is trying to achieve uh, would be for the physical therapy assistant after the physical therapist evaluates the patient via telehealth to be able to deliver the uh, physical therapy uh, visits without the physical presence of the physical therapist at the same location. Okay, so that has not yet been clarified by the APTA. Um, in regards now to uh, how many units you can bill and what codes you can bill, um, there was when APTA made that announcement, and you can go to 
um, uh, the website that we usually send you to, which is savephysicaltherapy.com under resources. And you are gonna be able to find there uh, both the direct announcement of uh, uh, APTA as well as the codes that's, that CMS has announced that they will pay. However, let me just address this. Are you going to uh, bill, can you bill a manual therapy code? Uh, I would advise you not. It's not gonna be uh, paid or it will be potentially contested. But can you bill a therapeutic exercise code 97110? Of course you can. Can you bill a proprioceptive training 97112? Yes. Can you bill a, a, a functional activity 97530? Yes. Uh, how does the coding work with the time that the patient spends with you? It works exactly the same way as if the patient was treated in your office. In other words, if you are, uh, if you do just, uh, let's say, 23 minutes, you can build two units, either of one unit of a, a different code and another unit of another code, or two units of the same code. Uh, or for three units, you're gonna be required to spend to doc and document 38 minutes spending with the uh, patient. So yes, the answer is you can get paid for more than one unit. You don't have to, uh, to just bill one unit, but you have to follow the, uh, the schedule of uh, the Medicare schedule and the Medicare guidelines of 15 minutes uh, and the eight minute rule. Okay, so 15 plus eight or 30 plus eight, 45 plus eight to build multiple units. So that's, that's uh, interesting there. And comparing it to an insurance, let's say, that is a major medical insurance that would not follow those specific guidelines of Medicare. Um, those insurances, they would follow the AMA type of schedule, which includes only the eight minute rule, in which case you could spend 32 minutes with a patient and bill four units, or 24 minutes with a patient and bill three units um, of that um, uh, service. So that's something to keep in mind as you are uh, treating uh, patients. So um, now um, it, it, it definitely for us uh, uh, made a difference uh, in our uh, conversions on telehealth uh, when, um, when we uh, got uh, when the Medicare um, change um, came about. Uh, and remember, all of these changes, the Medicare reimbursement is retroactive. So if you have any bills that you are holding, they are retroactive. Uh, I think they are retroactive the 1st of April, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I have to check on that. But they are definitely retroactive. So if you are holding any bills, you can definitely send those to uh, insurance companies. Um, uh, we'll give you a little bit of an update. Um, how are we doing in, uh, in terms of telehealth? And, and I would like to pose some of these questions uh, to uh, everyone um, uh, who is attending. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Costas, uh, just w w where are we at with, with numbers in, ter in terms of what percentage uh, are we seeing right now of our um, uh, pre-COVID-19 uh, visits? What percentage are we seeing right now? And what percentage of that percentage is uh, telehealth visits right now? Right. Um, again, uh, our numbers are related to the fact that we haven't got our money yet. We haven't received the PP loan. 
So we try to manage the office with, again, all the losses and, and try to be very frugal in who is working, what they do from all posts. And again, majority of our employees, the supportive employees are uh, situated at their places, their homes. So we have only one for this person, just therapist, and Nate, myself, I'm always here. And uh, maybe the deputy CEO that comes in and out based on needs. So we try to keep it as empty as possible for obvious reasons. Um, so from that point of view, we, um, in terms of numbers, we're gonna reach, let's say the 45% of what we used to have this week, which is a combination of both uh, actual visits and televisits. And the televisit part of it, it is maybe 40% of what we do right now. It is a tele PT related uh, treatments. The rest are actual visits. And again, it takes some effort to uh, provide that trust, that feeling to the patient so they know that they're coming to a place that it really cares about, first of all, the employees, the co-workers, and then second for them. And that's, and I do, I, I'm very specific on that. The priority is our co-workers, our own environment, and second comes the client in terms of safety right now. So we try anything possible. Whenever I step away from this office, I always have a mask on at all times, gloves at all times, everybody, even patients. Um, thank God, you know, Amazon right now, you can find masks, you know, in a very reasonable price of $35 per 50 of them. So we, uh, we get a lot of them. So we will be able to provide masks and gloves to all of our, not only therapists and, 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 and staff, but to all of our clients going forward. So this is the story with uh, our office here. Yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, I want also to um, uh, uh, clarify and just, and I would want to ask also those of you who have or have not received uh, uh, PPP money yet. In, in our case, we have uh, five different companies uh, and we have received PPP money in three out of the five companies, and we are waiting uh, money in two uh, companies yet. So, uh, in other words, um, uh, two thir uh, no, three, three fifths, whatever the month is, like 60%, 60%, uh, we have received the PPP money, and 40% uh, uh, of our uh, companies have not. So, um, now, I would like to address something, and, and I talked uh, about this um, earlier in a, a different uh, uh, meeting that I was a guest uh, for a few minutes. Um, so, people are looking for answers in terms of how to prepare for the uh, changes of how to prepare in the recovery for the recovery phase, okay? And I will tell you that it is not an answer, it's not like one answer fits all for that. And I will explain to you why. Um, when the pandemic started, its development was pretty fast. I mean, New York has been ground zero uh, and it traveled very fast throughout the United States. So the, the effects of it uh, pretty much were realized within a period of about two weeks kind of across the country. Now, at this point in time though, the, the recovery will be different because different states are opening in a different way and the effects of that opening will be different in different states depending on their population and the density of the population. Let me explain that more. I was speaking this morning with my very good friend, Kathy Blair from, um, uh, gosh, uh, am I blanking out now? From, uh, 
the state of Wyoming. And as of this Monday, um, they have been completely open and it is business as usual. So pretty much she sees almost the volume that she had before. And because of the way that change happened, she doesn't have really to make significant changes. This is very different with um, larger cities where the effects of the pandemic are greater. Uh, more people uh, have been staying at home and the fear that these people have because of the greater density of the population is greater. And, 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 and um, people that I talk to about this, I ask them this very question. What tomorrow morning you have to take a flight to go somewhere, which airline are you going to book a ticket with? An airline that runs at 90 to 100 percent capacity and charges you $299 for the ticket, or you're going to pay $100 more to get a ticket with the airline that runs at only 50 percent capacity, where the middle seat is open, or they have uh, a couple of rows in between, or one row. Um, with people one row without people, or they, they create a pattern of how the passengers sit uh, in the plane based on a uh, social distancing configuration. I'm going to choose to pay $100 more and go to with that airline that maintains a social distancing, the, where they have masks or they offer to the passengers masks. Um, I'm not going to go to a restaurant where I butt elbows with the person next to me. I'm going to go to a restaurant where the next table is like five, six feet away. So certain places, certain states will have to do such accommodations. Like in our situation here in New York, New York where we're at, I mean, we are thinking this way long term and the changes we're making right now in our practice are not short term changes. They are operational changes. We're changing our operating basis. And I'm going to explain a few things that we do. We're changing our operating basis that will be OK for the next a year and a half or so. Because in places like New York uh, or California or I would say even uh, Texas or Massachusetts, some area, Florida even, that, are, that there is greater degree of population. Yes, right now you have a COVID-19 situation and maybe some of the numbers are dwindling down, but October and November comes, you're going to have to deal with two problems, with a covid situation and patients and with a flu situation and patients. So because we don't know exactly how those developments will take place, at least we are thinking forward and we are making changes that create sustainability of our operational basis for the long term. What do I mean by that? Um, instead of having patients, for example, uh, coming massively into the office and having in, in, in the office, you know, 15, 20 patients at a given time, we are changing our schedules and uh, let's say we are scheduling now only two patients per hour. So this way that can create a lessening number of patients that will be at the same time in the same environment. Now the question is how sustainable financially something like that can be. We used to have in our practice one therapist with one PTA at all times. 
Well, that is not a sustainable model though. You will need to schedule maybe three patients an hour to create that, to, to have a sustainable model like that. So now we do not have, we are not pairing a therapist with a tech. We have a couple of techs or ATCs in the office, but handling only the gym area. We're trying to create procedures where patients will be able to check in uh, in a touchless capacity or just, just, just by pressing a button. Um, we're looking at putting in the office a flow of patients where no patient comes and goes from the same area, but patients walk in, there are arrows, no more than four patients wait in the waiting area. And once they check in and they walk in the office through with following those arrows, they go to a private room and they get their hands-on manual therapy treatment inside the private room where they feel more safe. They feel more secure in that capacity with personal protective equipment that all of the therapists wear and we have available for the use of the patients also. And then patients exiting the, the, the private room and moving again through the arrows that dictate the patient flow into a gym area. And we are looking right now at installing in our gym like um, clear plastic panels in between bicycles, in between treadmills, to create an environment of um, safety, privacy, but not so much privacy because they are clear, but safety without having a feeling of isolation. But still, when you have a protective shield where that is being cleaned at all times, together with the equipment, you feel safer as a patient. Uh, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, uh, uh, Dimi, uh, just for you guys to let you know, we have patients coming in from other offices because when they go for therapy to other offices, they don't use any masks or gloves, so they don't want to go there anymore. So they come to us because they see that we take care of the space and we take care of them. So it is a very, very important uh, detail to Again, the word for me, it's trust. You know, if they trust us, they will come. They don't trust us. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter how good you are when it comes to your manual skills, they will not come in. So the priority right now is to create that trust environment so people are, are, are going to start coming in. And another thing that I was looking at, I was talking with Dimi yesterday, uh, I was reading an article that in Hong Kong, in the airport there, they're gonna uh, install this kind of uh, small areas that you enter and you get decontaminated with some, they spray on you for 45 seconds so they can decontaminate you. And I'm thinking, you know what? What about if we get this uh, device also here in the office? So anyway, well, I'm looking into that and we'll let you know if we find something more specific about it, I'll let you know and maybe that's a way to uh, build more trust, okay? I, I, definitely, and, and um, I'll, I'll share if you guys like, um, uh, this is, here, I'll share it. This is a, a, a final cut of uh, a promo piece um, that will go to our website by tomorrow uh, and to the social media. Uh, this is how we market our office, okay? I'm gonna share it, and actually I'm gonna ask you if anybody has created something similar that you guys want to share it, that would be awesome too. Uh, here we go, I'll play it for you. At Hands-On Physical Therapy, we care both for your recovery as well as for your safety. This is why we enforce the strictest safety CDC and OSHA sure recommendations. recommendations. Large open spaces, protective equipment for both patients and therapists, constant space cleaning and sanitization, and even private treatment rooms for your added comfort. And while hands-on physical therapy is open and ready to see you in person in our Astoria office, our physical therapy experts can provide telehealth treatments in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Maryland. 
Hands-on physical therapy has been a pioneer in telehealth, and our founders have educated hundreds of other therapists across the country on the keys to telehealth and physical therapy. If you live in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Florida, or Maryland, schedule now an appointment with us at www.handsonpt.org. So anyway, that's, that's just to, to show you a, a little sample in terms of um, how um, we are using at least the idea of um, differentiating ourselves, differentiating our practice as an environment that somebody can feel safe. And we believe that this is going to be very important um, uh, in the near future. Uh, because we have seen it already, as Costa said, people would come to our office and they'll say, uh, okay, I was going there and they don't use uh, masks. They don't have, um, they don't have uh, gloves. So um, that's, that's very important. Um, I will address uh, the issue of uh, PPP in a second, uh, but I want to share something with you guys um, uh, so that, um, oops. Hold on a second, I need to get out of here. Um, I will share with you real quick this. Uh, as you guys know, uh, we are doing, um, we have the PT for Heroes campaign. Uh, and many, many of you are members on, on this campaign and you have shared your stories uh, and it's been amazing. I mean, uh, I don't know if you guys realized that the Pity for Heroes campaign, it was, um, uh, it made it into the New York Post just yesterday. Um, so, which is really great. So next week, next um, Tuesday at 7 p.m., we are doing uh, an honoring of our heroes event. It's an online event. It takes place at 7 p.m. Eastern. And I am going to post the link in a moment. Um, and um, I would, we would love for you guys to register, to be part of the event, and not just being part of the event, but also uh, for you to share this with uh, uh, doctors, nurses, any other healthcare providers, and for you to bring your own stories that uh, you may have uh, and share your stories, bring videos, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, we'll, we'll appreciate if you join this and, and, and contribute uh, anything you can uh, uh, during uh, that event. Um, a quick, a quick uh, thing before I address PPP uh, issues, I'm going to pick on a couple of people here who I know that they have implemented specific things in their practices. And I would like us to give us an idea um, uh, on what they have done already. And uh, yes, um, Christina, I'm coming to you. If you don't mind, share your uh, your camera um, and just uh, unmute yourself and give us an idea of uh, what are you doing with your numbers and what changes have you made um, in your practice? That's me after a run now. <laughs> Anyways, you know, we got our money. We're already, this is our fourth week of our eight week spend. So we wanted to make sure that when we brought everybody back that we were having them direct their attention to anything that would help our patients, communicate with our patients, and not just be paid by the hour. So I think I had shared with you before, we made like a little um, grid. And so I told everybody, I want you to work 40 hours. I want you to come up with 40 billable hours, but I want those hours to be directed towards these things. So anytime they treat a patient, they treat two patients, they get to bill for one hour. This is for us. Um, two telehealth patients is an hour. Four workers come for no fault check-ins is an hour. And then I, the biggest thing that we needed to work on was 
getting in touch with evals that never arrived, suspended treatment plans that didn't arrive, um, past patients from a year ago. So we ran lists like same time period last year. And we, I came up with that. If they call eight people and really have real conversations, they can get paid for an hour. The other things that we added was, um, I told everyone they can do two hours of volunteer work. So stop by the local food bank or their church or their synagogue or the community center, pick up food and do delivery. So that like we're reaching out and doing good things. We also do a um, couple hours, they can bill for time making videos. So I have, they're just, they got really creative. Like they're doing exercise challenges and oh, this was a great telehealth session. Then the other thing we did was um, we're giving them time to, they get um, hours towards um, continuing ed that we want to do. So we're going to do like the neurofascial course that you're offering. We're going to, we're not going to do it on Saturday, but they're going to do it during their work hours and they'll get credit for that. I put one therapist on compliance. So he gets credit for the time that he's putting in doing compliance. And it really made it, it really, really, really made a difference. Like we bottomed out, you know, when we're on Long Island, 33%. But last week we had, we actually had 50% of our normal referrals. And it really was, I mean, they were on the phones like crazy. I mean, just like calling everybody and oh, also getting people signed up for telehealth. But I think last week we did like 48% with 25% telehealth. And then this week, I'm looking at 60% of our norm, our, our two best weeks with only 20% telehealth. So it seems like if we can get the patients on the phone and keep in contact with them, they start to feel safer. And then they're like, wait, you're open? Oh, I'll come in. You know, so it, it definitely, that's kind of like, that's what we've been doing. That's, that's right. awesome, uh, um, Christina. And um, uh, jumping a little bit into the uh, PPP money, since you got the money um, four weeks ago. So this is your fourth week, right? Yeah. Uh, that's your fourth week. So th th there are, th there is a question on this that is kind of lingering, which is the following. Let's suppose that you got your, your eight weeks is up, let's say on June 15th. Okay. Mine is up June 8th. <laughs> Yours is June 8th. Okay. So the, the provision of forgiveness to reach the previous number of employees is ending on June 30th. They tell you that by June 30th, you have to have brought back all of your employees. Uh, what I have not been able to clarify with anyone that I have asked about this uh, at this point is that if your eight weeks ends like yours on June 8th, does it mean then that from June 8th to June 30th, you still have to maintain all of these people you have on the payroll in order for you to be able to qualify for the forgiveness? Well, that's, that, that's a big thing that we're yeah. like, we've been, we've been really scared about. So like, I literally, every time Bob Kowalczyk is on one of the lines, I re ask that question. He seems to feel very strongly that if in my eight weeks, I can match the full-time equivalents, which we are matching at 33.3, .3, which is our January, February full-time equivalents and spend all the money it'll be forgiven. But for us, the reason that we've been putting so much attention on communication, like I'm just, my biggest number I'm looking at is new business, new business, new business, is because I feel like we need to be, I need to somehow get to 100% by June 1st. Yep. And then yep. that way I'll feel more comfortable. I'll have that bridge. I won't have, I won't have the PPP money, but I know I'll have the business to pay everybody so that's been like so with everyone that's what i'm like I, I i literally i use mount everest i'm like this is a race this is a race to get back to normal before june 1st yeah. like what do we need to do to get back to normal so that that's like the race we're playing but bob seems to think that 
if I can show that, that June 30th wouldn't matter if I had to decrease people. But I, his also thing is like, just don't be in that position. I mean, he uh, said other things like, we normally would do payroll on June 12th, but we're going to, we're going to make the payroll hit on June 7th. You know, like, you know, like you got to be really. Yeah, at, at least the two new pieces of information that we've had uh, uh, that came out this week uh, was one of them is favorable, the other one, whatever, not so favorable. But the, the favorable piece of information was that if you have an employee where you are documenting that you want them to come back to work and that employee is refusing to come back to work, um, that does not count against you, okay? So let's say, because the provisions are not only that you have to spend 75% of the money on payroll, but also the second provision is that you must maintain the same number of employees. Even if you maintain, even if you spend 75% of the money on payroll, but you had 10 employees and now you have eight employees, they will uh, uh, charge you for, that, for those two employees uh, that are not with you any longer. Uh, so you have to show that the number also that you had before is the same as the number of people that you have now, unless you offered the job back to an employee that you had let go and that employee is refusing or is submitting a letter of resignation and then it's not your uh, penalty. That was the first um, that was the first uh, uh, thing that we found out this week. The second thing we found out this week is that any funds, any funds that you will that will not be forgiven, are considered taxable income. So you have to pay if you keep the funds. You got a hundred thousand dollars, seventy thousand were forgiven. You will have an option to return back the 30,000 or maintain those, keep the 30,000 at 1% as an 1% loan deferred for six months, payable over a 24 month period, but that amount is taxable. So you have to think also uh, about that. There's, uh, another, there's another really important piece that like for people that haven't gotten the money to look at is they're going to look at any employee that worked in January, February, you cannot pay them less than 75%. So like when we had some people that didn't want to come back, we pretty much on week three, I was like, this is it. You're either coming back or like we made decisions for some people that didn't come back. I'm not letting them come back until after the eight weeks spend because like if they came back at four weeks, I had no way for them to earn 75% of what they earned. And it, they're crazy rules, but you know, so like literally I had like each person, I'm like looking at them and going like, okay, they work 320 hours. They have to work this many hours, make this amount of money. So you gotta be careful about that too. And I don't even know how they're going to figure that in. Like, how's that going to cost you? But so, and, and they are looking at, I'm answering somebody who says part-time or full-time, they're looking at FTEs, full-time equivalencies. Okay, so you have two employees, each of them 20 hours a week, that is, is equal to one full-time employee. Um, so, and the applications for forgiveness, which we have not had an application sample as of yet, uh, the banks, have 60 days to review them. So essentially, if everything goes by the book, and quite frankly, nothing has gone by the book right now, as of, as of today, <laughs> there have been always problems. Um, uh, if everything goes by the book um, and you submit your application, let's say on July 1st, because you cannot submit it before the 30th of June, Let's say you submit it the day after July 1st, you have the whole month of July and the whole month of August that the bank 
does not have to answer back to you. They can answer back to you 60 days later, so end of August, if the funds will be uh, forgiven uh, or not. So that's uh, uh, an, important, um, an important thing. So if you have an employee who was working five days a week, let's say, right? And that employee was making $100,000. If this employee now decides to work for you only three days a week, okay? That's not gonna cut it, okay? You, or two days a week. That's not gonna cut it because they are gonna be earning in essence 40% or 50% of what they were earning before. And an employee cannot earn less than 25% of what they were previously earning in order for that amount to be forgiven. So if you have an employee who before COVID-19 was working five days a week and all of a sudden now they tell you, no, I want to work only, um, I don't know, uh, twice a week or three days a week. That's not going to cut it. They will have to work a minimum of four days a week um, to really marginally make it. Because at four days a week, they would be making 80% of their previous salary. If they make anything less than 75% of their previous salary, that, that amount of money is not forgiven, okay? So important thing to know. However, the advantage of that is that in reality, that does not have to happen until the end of June. But of course, you have to make sure that you are able to spend the money also until that time. Um, all right. What happens if a front desk FTE prefers to stay on unemployment. Um, okay, there is no such a thing as prefers to remain in unemployment. Okay, so, so, so here is how that works. If you have an employee that you actually fired, okay, and they claimed unemployment, okay, then they are fired from your organization. Now, they are claiming unemployment and supposedly they can start looking for a job. But if you have furloughed, furloughed an employee and you take them back, you say, yeah, I've furloughed you, you, I'm taking you back. If that person says, oh, I don't want to come back, then that person is refusing and therefore it's not your fault that they are not coming back. And I don't know if the labor department will give them uh, unemployment benefits either. That's a different story. But at least you're not going to be penalized uh, by not considering that as part of your full-time equivalent people. Um, okay. I wanted um, to ask uh, also a couple of other people here I don't know. I have uh, uh, three people that I can ask and uh, anyone can unmute your mics. Uh, maybe Brian, Brian Kelly, or uh, maybe uh, we can have something from Ed Bloom or um, something from Carol Stillman. Um, who else is here? Uh, uh, maybe um, we can hear from Dana and Kay. Just an idea uh, as to what changes have you made in your physical therapy practice right now? And what, which of these changes are you still planning to uh, maintain for the future? Anyone who would like to share? Come on, guys, it's about sharing. Okay, Carol, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for asking the question. Um, well, I closed March 24th um, and reopened this past Monday. I, and um, so it's going so much better than I ever thought. And the reason we made the decision to reopen May 4th is I had had um, one of my, because I had laid off all my employees and I had one of them start making phone calls and rehired him back. 
said, people really want to know when we're going to open. So I was like, well, if you're ready to come in, let's open. So I opened on Monday um, with um, two PTs and front desk. And then I had my second front desk person become in charge of, of the um, COVID playbook, which we got from the PPS. So she's at the front um, doing temperature screening and we'll keep doing that and asking the CDC questions. And so she's making sure that everything is sanitized between the therapists. And then just like everyone else, we have the waiting room that you know has specific seats and um, we're following all the guidelines, but one, th it's not it, great. I mean, we're at 23% so far this week compared to a year ago but I didn't know where we'd be at. So we have a lot of work in front of us and we're gonna change how we market and we're gonna market to a different demographic because um, right now um, I, I think doing more pelvic health is um, an area that people um, still are coming in. And so we're gonna focus more on that. And um, I'm happy to share with anyone offline what we, what we've done because we just reopened. Awesome. Uh, uh, Carol, uh, uh, the question that I want some clarification from your viewpoint, what long-term changes do you, are you planning to make? Um, well, that's hard for me to answer since I've just opened up. I mean, and, and we're waiting for our pool to open up because um, that to me would be an easier place to um, social distance because we have a big pool, but you know we'll definitely um, long term um, flex our hours. Um, we may open on Sunday. We used to be open Saturday, and just really more with the um, social physical distancing would be a long term change. Yep. And um, doing more, um, trying to do more telehealth, but I don't know yet. It, so I really I'm new at this. Yeah. Un un understood, understood. Uh, Venice, uh, you want to share? Uh, thank you, Carol. Appreciate your sharing. Um, v Venice, um, you got it. Give us some insight from your side. So I never closed. Um, I stayed open, but I had to drop it down to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, instead of a 12 hour day, it started with a four hour day. Now I'm up to a six hour day. I had a record. 19 patients yesterday typically i would do 60 to 80 you know um but um i asked everyone at the very beginning i had a zoom office meeting i have 12 employees um this was back in march and who said they were exposed and wanted to self-isolate who said you know they had an older mother so i didn't have to tell them to furlough they just furloughed themselves um, so I have four people, two in the office part, three, two in the office part time. The office manager stayed because we needed to get out billing anyway and get the AR. And uh, one uh, person in, um, helping me in the office, which is my son, we, and I figured, you know what, we're both under the same roof. If one gets it, both are getting. We changed everything to every other table, two people an hour. And uh, everyone say, and feels safe. They all come in. They don't sign in. They wash their hands. We give them gloves. They come in with masks. And uh, I've been putting on Facebook. I, uh, I did Google. I did Instagram. I don't do it every day. Maybe I should. You know, we're open. I did uh, a bunch of telehealths. And I actually did a telehealth the other day of an evaluation on an old, um, a previous patient that had a new injury. And I was happy to say I listened to your as far as how much to charge and I charge them $50 for the half an hour instead of the, the normal fee I told them and they were most gracious and they want another telehealth visit tomorrow and she went from you know 90 degrees to 120 degrees of shoulder flexion I did the whole evaluation I you know I wasn't manually doing it but I did all my shoulder tests but she was the therapist you know it's almost like teaching my students at Stony Brook so um as far as ramping up, I'm gonna be taking that course this weekend on Saturday, um, you know, that they're um, offering, Tim is offering with Paul. And um, then I did get the PPP money about 10 days ago. Um, 
and I'm hoping to bring back the staff May 15th. But again, if there are not enough patients, I'm not sure if they're going to want to come back. But, you know, they might do other things in the office, uh, clean up the office, set up the new exercise programs, do more marketing. You know, I've been doing it all. But and I thank you for everything you do, Dimitri. I, I've been enjoying all these webinars. So in town hall meetings. Thank, thank you, Venice. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and um, uh, it, it definitely, it, 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 we have to think along these terms in terms of looking at the long term changes we are going to do. Um, and, and, and think about this we have to learn a lesson now. What, how prepared? were we with what we did. If let's say the government did not give any of this PPP money, were we prepared? Did we have enough reserves on the side to be able to maintain our businesses? What will happen if next year we have another pandemic like this? What measures do we have to take right now to make sure that we're gonna be able to withstand that pandemic? At that time, a year from now, if something like this happened, will the government be willing or capable to offer PPP money again, especially in a non-election year? A lot of things are happening this year because we have in front of us an election year. So when we go and, and, and we fill out those charts there and and we decide who will elect, there is some power to that. So these people, to some degree, they are thinking along with this. But if that is not an issue, because it's gonna be past the elections, I don't know if PPP money is gonna be available. So we really have to think also boosting our reserves as, as companies, as private practitioners, okay? And think about this not all of our colleagues will be able to reopen. There'll be some of them that won't be able to reopen. Another okay. problem, another problem Jimmy, that I, at least I foresee going forward, um, is the unemployment rate, because a lot of people are not gonna be able to go back to work for whatever reasons. And especially here in New York, I was listening this morning, you know, WNYC, the radio station, and the, one of the issues is, how do you take all these workers from suburbs or from the five boroughs or the boroughs to Manhattan. Uh, the, the subway cannot handle the six feet scenario. They cannot handle masks for everybody. So there is a big deal of a problem trying to figure out how to move massive amounts of people from one location to another. That's one thing. And second, that a lot of people, they're not going to have any insurances. So our volume is going to decrease because of that. And we need to start calculating along these lines, you know, and maybe changing the way we practice or bring other kind of practices in and, and make sure that we're going to be able to handle that possible decrease of, uh, of patient volume because of lack of, or the other thing, you know, maybe the state is going to decide to uh, decrease the payments to Medicaid uh, coverage. It happened in other states, by the way, and it might happen in New York. So there are a lot of little things that we have to think along the lines and make sure that our operation is going to be able to um, sustain this kind of impact. Yeah, and, and, and agree, Christina, with what you say that we need to increase our average reimbursement so our profit margins are better. Um, uh, yes, um, making changes in the operational basis can decrease cost and help in the increase of profit margin. However, decreasing costs will help you only so much. You can decrease your cost only so much. At the end of the day, you have to be able to survive or your therapist have to be able to survive on a salary. You have to be able to have some competitive salaries to be able to hire therapists. So on the regulating the expense, decreasing the expenses, yes, you may have some cushion, but not large enough cushion. The idea is bringing more money in. How do you do that? 
Will insurance companies pay more for 97110? No, they're not going to pay more. All of a sudden, they'll say, hey, because we have we had just a pandemic, we're deciding to pay more for therapeutic exercise so the physical therapist can put more money on the side. They're not going to do that. So the alternative to that is bringing into a practice some other type of higher reimbursement services. From our side, we have diagnostics, okay? Costas and I and you, Christina, and a whole bunch of other people here who are members of hands-on diagnostics. We have the Brad is here. We bring diagnostics. Diagnostics pay three to five to 10 times in some states greater than a single physical therapy visit. Other therapists have other niche services that they can charge for cash. Some people have laser services. Some people have like Carol, Carol, the, the, the pelvic health uh, uh, services. Those are all additional things that you can bring into a practice so you can increase your profit margins, okay? So that is where the, the game will be won because unless you are able to increase your profit margins, you are not gonna make it through in a threatening uh, environment um, out there. Um, guys, I only have, I'm sorry, uh, uh, three minutes before we, are, uh, we need to get off. So uh, Tim, um, you are on, uh, you have just a, a minute to just talk to us a little bit about the course that you are offering that uh, Venice mentioned about. Okay, Th thanks, Demi. Uh, my name is Tim Mantis. I work at Survival Strategies. Some of you guys know me, um, doing this for 25 years. On Saturday, Paul Savlosky and I, Paul's a PT out of Kansas, and I uh, met him about, I don't know, 24, 25 years ago. Around the same time I met uh, Demi and Costas, and not too long after that, Christina. So uh, we're going to be hosting eight hours nonstop keys to private practice success. What are the real fundamentals? If you're able to survive, it's gonna be because you're probably lucky, uh, you probably got some funding, and hopefully you're doing a number of things right. We're gonna expand that last issue, the number of things that you're doing right in one day, okay? That's my promise to you guys. <laughs> so come, it's $199. Go to the link that I put on the chat. It's uh, survivalstrategies.com forward slash shop. And uh, it's all based on the book, The Keys to Private Practice Success. It's the best selling book for private practice PT of all time. So please come, you get a copy of the book with it. We ship it out, you'll get it in a couple of days, you'll love it. And um, I think I did that in under, uh, I don't know, 90 seconds. That's awesome, man. Very nice, very, very well done. And um, uh, Oh, who went on maternity leave, how this will play out when I get the PPP money, anybody have a clue? Um, okay, Niles, I will forward to you something that most likely will address the maternity leave, but uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll forward to you something about that. I think I may have received something on uh, that earlier. Um, we'll see you guys uh, on Tuesday night, remember, uh, go to savephysicaltherapy.com and register for the Honoring Our Heroes event Tuesday night uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern and next Thursday at 1 o'clock uh, here again for our weekly town hall meeting. We'll have something very interesting to talk about. If any of you wants to do a discovery call uh, to find out how you can join now uh, hands-on diagnostics just with a $5,000 initial payment, go to hudsmeeting.com or hudsmeetings.com, one of the two, and uh, book an appointment there. Okay, guys, take care, everyone. Um, thank you all who shared today. All right. Thank you. Thank you.